So I grew up um, in Nigeria and um, I am the product of a, of a Nigerian father and a Trinidadian mother. And so um, I grew up really thinking about identity, thinking about blackness, um, thinking about the differences in culture, you know, for, for my father and my mother, my father's people, my mother's people. Um, and I sort of trace this interest um, from childhood into um, my undergraduate studies, um, where I, I um, focused in on um, literature of the African diaspora, um, took, took that into a master's, both in, in Nigeria. Um, and during my master's, I decided to focus again on literature of the diaspora, but um, focused mostly on poetry and looked at um, African-American poetry. Um, and when I started studying Langston Hughes and Amiri Baraka, um, I started thinking about or hearing the cadence of the poetry and decided that I wanted to compare, because all this time I'd been also interested in, in music. Um, so I thought I would compare their cadences and align them with the with the jazz of, of their era. So Langston Hughes and Louis Armstrong, Amiri Baraka and Miles Davis. Um, and I just got caught in the um, in the the potential that music can can offer in terms of um, expounding on the histories and the expression of, of black people. And so um, so that's kind of how I came into the study of music was through the study of poetry. And, um, and then I heard about this thing called ethnomusicology. Um, and so a few years later, I decided um, I had heard about it and um, we didn't have ethnomusicology in Nigeria, but um, I had a wonderful pro professor who actually met Ruth Stone. I don't even know if she's ever heard this, but he met Ruth Stone at a conference um, and or something. And, um, and then he sent me, the Indiana University um, bro brochure, and um, and that's how I that's how I heard about ethno, that's how I heard about Indiana, um, and so I applied. Everything sort of aligned, um, and it's become a really wonderful field for me um, as I've thought about the 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 history of my of my parents, but also the history of Black people um, worldwide. So I always say that Indiana was the best place for me. Um, you know, again, coming from the humanities, coming from a, a more of a cultural studies background, um, I did not have the um, musical training that so many of my of my peers did coming into the cohort. Um, and so Indiana was wonderful for me because it is. It, it was housed in the, in the Institute for Ethnomusicology and Folklore. And so the study of folklore and ethnomusicology um, combined was the right fit for me. You know, um, at Indiana, ethnomusicology um, can have a, a more literary connection, a more anthropological, connection as well. Um, yes, I still had to, to, to do transcription and analysis, which was my the hardest thing I, I did, but, um, but, but it had to be done. It was a, a, a requirement. Um, and I had a wonderful professor who, um, by the name of Ron Smith, who was uh, just a wonderful mentor as well. And then of course I had Portia Maltzby, Melanie Burnham, Ruth Stone, um, Sue Tui. I mean, some really wonderful professors and then I should mention I had a great, a great um, group of, of uh, classmates as well who really um, we helped each other um, to, to get through it. So Indiana was the right place for me. I think it was also a good place to start um, in the United States um, as an as a as an immigrant. Um, you know, it's um, yes, it's in the state that where the KKK was 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 started, but. Bloomington itself is a really great, um, a great island in 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 the state of Indiana, where um, it, which had a lot of people from all over the world. So, um, so yeah, I think I think that um, Indiana was a great place for me. Um, so research, um, I started off with. So my dis dissertation was on the study of 
of black people in in the classical music world with a folk with a specific focus on uh, uh, soprano uh, African American soprano by the name of Camilla Williams, who was the first black woman to sign a major contract with a major opera company, um, the New York City Opera. Um, and so that was my so my dissertation was looking at 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 her her personal history, her career, um, and how someone like me could work with someone like her. You know, both both black women, but different generations, different um, backgrounds, different un understandings of the the construct of blackness, um, and and different voices. And so the dissertation was all about that. And then, um, and then I, I, while I was doing that, I was also really interested. I took a class with Portia Maltzby on, on hip hop and um, became interested in Nigerian hip hop um, since that's where I grew up and I knew Nigerian hip hop well. Um, but I was interested in the, in the connections between um, African American hip hop and Nigerian hip hop um, and where the connections lay the, um, whether, whether there was a sort of appropriation and so on. Um, so I did that. And I also grew up on Fela and Nicola Kuti. So um, also did work on, I became obsessed with his mother um, who was a black woman who did some incredible things in Nigeria in the 1940s politically. And I, I discovered that she had also, um, uh, she and the woman that she, um, that she led had also used songs and music. And so I started, so my research was, was kind of focused on Camilla Williams, Nigerian hip hop and, um, and Afrobeat. And what connects all, the, all these three is identity, um, race, um, power, um, social justice also, um, and then, and, and history. So I am also really proud of the ways in which I've used um, my research and my scholarship in ethnomusicology as an ethnomusicologist to drive change on our on our campuses. Um, so as you know, I'm at the University of Missouri, and we had a major um, a major uh, movement on our campus by students. Um, but mostly black students who really wanted the campus to do a better job of um, re responding to national crises um, that had to, to do with the ways in which black people were, were treated, um, all the murders that we saw um, most recently, of course, in the, in the second half of the 20, in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, and so, um, and the first decade actually. And so um, our students also got tired of being called the N-word on campus and being, being treated um, like a second class citizen on our campus. And this is not exclusive to the University of Missouri, of course, students of color all across the country um, had sort of had enough, right? So we, we had that major movement at Mizzou, which I think really galvanized other campuses. Um, and as a result of that movement, at the time I was chair of the Department of Black Studies um, and also had a joint appointment in the, in the School of Music, we decided that the university decided that they would, they would um, ask me to create some kind of program that would orient all future incoming students on you know, the sort of values of, of humanity and citizenship. Um, and so we created, a program with my students where we just used music, um, thought about music and culture and how music has the power to really um, engage those conversations that are sometimes very difficult. Um, and so my, my students formed um, an ensemble. They chose the music. I said, let's, let's find some, some really, um, some really provoking um, or provocative um, songs that can help us get to the um, the real, the points that we want our students to to take away, and so we came up with um, Bob Dylan and 
um, songs like Blowing in the Wind, a song like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Um, and we use those, that music to generate a conversation among all our incoming students. And keep in mind, we're in the state of Missouri. So we have students from very small rural towns and from large cities and indeed from around the world. Um, and so they've, they've heard these songs be before, but they've not been asked to engage with what those questions are that are still blowing in the wind. And so that took us on a journey back into the history, back into the, the ways in which we've been socialized around issues of race, um, you know, environmental um, justice, um, war and peace, you know, all of those of those things. Um, and so that's that's something that I'm proud of in terms of a of a of a um, a career highlight. Um, I have been a faculty member. I have been a chair. I, I am um, now in 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 the dean's office and. Um, and, I, and I'm constantly seeing how we can use music and the study of music to really drive change on our campuses. I think ethnomusicology is unique in the sense that it is a field that, that rests on something that everybody lo loves, right? Music, like everybody loves that, you know, it's not, it's not like chemistry, like not everybody loves the study of carbon dioxide, right? But everybody loves music. And, and yet we bring a, a framing to it and a, a real analytical lens to it that really un, unveils and uncovers um, so much depth, right? So that it becomes, music then be, becomes this, um, this avenue, right, into um, some of the most um, important questions of the society. Um, it's a way to really get to the very essence of what a democracy might mean. You know, whether you're looking at hip hop or country music, which I also study, or um, or or opera, right? There, there is a there's a there's a way in which the study of music through and through ethnomusicology um, can, can really um, get to those, um, those critical questions. So yeah, I, I do, and, I've, and I, I've, I've done it, I've, I've used it, um, and I continue to, to use it as I talk to people about um, inclusion and diversity, as I talk to people about um, democracy and citizenship and, and all, all of these things. Um, I think ethnomusicology has a lot to offer. 